What I have to start with is this book here called The Story of the Stars by G.F. Chambers, fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. And it was published in 1903. And if you just open to the front page, it's got this beautiful picture here. And the book says, there is one elliptical nebula which stands out beyond all the rest, yet its great size, brilliancy, and peculiar features forbid it being regarded as a typical elliptic nebulae. I am here alluding to the great nebula in Andromeda, Messier's 31st. All right, Nick, it's time for something exciting, isn't it, mate? What do you got for us? Well, in view of the sky conditions that we've sort of been battling with all night, it's always a good thing to image something bright. And one of the very brightest deep sky targets is, of course, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. And this has been imaged by just about everybody who's ever pointed a telescope at the sky with a camera attached. The telescope, in a way, is almost too powerful, so we'll only get the central part. We'll take a snapshot image. This is just to place the target on the chip, and then we can concentrate on taking a longer image after that to maybe pick up some of the dust lanes. Of all the Messier objects, surely this is the big one. It is both metaphorically and physically, actually. It's huge on the sky. It's actually about five degrees across. It's, of course, galaxies don't have sharp edges, so you can't say exactly where it ends. But if you think about it, the moon's about half a degree across, so this is ten times the size of the full moon across. The reason why you don't see it booming out at you in the sky is because it's very, very faint. You can just about see it with the naked eye, but not all of it. So as with most galaxies, it's brightest in the middle and then fades out. So you can just about see the nucleus. If you find somewhere very dark, it's, I believe, the most n uh, distant object you can see with the naked eye. What's key here is it's not called the Great Spiral Galaxy Andromeda, it's called the Great Nebula, because at this time in the history of astronomy, we didn't know what these objects were. The idea that a spiral nebula could actually be external to our own galaxy wasn't a new idea. Wright quite correctly surmised in 1750 that our own Milky Way could be a flattened disk of stars. Immanuel Kant, five years later, postulated this theory of island universes, that our Milky Way was one of many disjoint and separate collections of stars. This leads us to a very, very important question. Where is our place in the universe? How do we map out the space around us? and how do we fix ourselves in amongst all of these objects that we observe. And the Andromeda Galaxy was really key for making a very big change in our understanding of this. So what the software is doing at the moment, in the top left hand of the screen you can see the guide star. Now this is the star that the telescope's looking at in the sky. Remember everything in the sky is moving. The equipment that we're using here has to track the motion of the sky very accurately. So we hopefully won't see too much movement of that. And whilst that's guiding the telescope, the main imaging camera will be taking, in this case, a two-minute exposure. The thing is, the Andromeda Galaxy, whilst it's the biggest and brightest galaxy in the sky, it's still quite a tricky galaxy to image because, as you can see from this image here, the nucleus of the galaxy is so bright compared to the outer spiral arms. So we still have to take lots of images to actually get a good end result. In 1920, a very important event in scientific history took place called the Great Debate. The Smithsonian Natural History Museum hosted this debate between Shapley and Curtis. The astronomers divide into two camps, one of which says, no, these spiral nebulae are actually inside our own galaxy and they're just funny, strange objects and the Milky Way as we see it is essentially the entirety of our observable universe. Whereas on the other camp you have the proponents of the island universe theory and it really sort of summarized the state of where we were as a community at that time. It wasn't until 1925 that this issue was really put to rest by the very very famous observations by Edwin Hubble who used the Mount Wilson 100-inch telescope, the largest telescope in the world at that time, to measure Cepheid variables in M31. And these are a very, very special class of stars that are known as standard candles. So by measuring how they vary in a particular way, you can figure out how bright they are, and that lets you find out how far away they were. And this conclusively proved that the distance to M31 was such that it is actually 2.5 million light years 
away outside our galaxy. It's the other really big galaxy in the local group. So the local group is this collection of a dozen or so galaxies um, of which the two largest members are the Milky Way and M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. There's a fairly long-running argument as to which is the biggest and which is slightly not quite so big. You know, it's like the Milky Way, it's got a disk of stars, it's got a bulge in the middle. The bulge is clearly not quite round in the case of the Andromeda Galaxy, and we think it's the same in the Milky Way. There's a kind of a bar-shaped bulge in the middle. So as far as we can tell, it really is very similar to the Milky Way. A spiral galaxy, in the same way as our Milky Way, has a, not only a collection of stars in a, in a spiral shape, but there's a lot of gas and dust in between the stars. And the nice thing about the Andromeda Galaxy is tilted over at an intermediate angle. And that does give us a chance to see the two dust lanes that sort of delineate the spiral arms effectively very, very clearly. Now to do the job properly, what we have to do is take at least a couple of hours worth of images. I don't think the sky will allow us to do that tonight. But um, if we were able to do that with selective processing, we can shrink the size of the nucleus of the galaxy and then we'll start to bring out the fainter dust lanes. There's a lot of noise in the image as well because the sky is so artificially bright by the moonlight. You can see these sort of dust effects and things like that. So it's not a pretty image, but certainly we could go ahead and take, um, you know, maybe another three hours worth like that and then we'd start to get a fairly strong image. Although on the brighter end of things, it's a beautiful, regular, normal looking spiral galaxy. If you take very deep exposures and really look at the faintest parts of this galaxy, you find it's a complete mess. There's all sorts of things going on around it. So here's a classic picture of the galaxy. There's the galaxy itself in the middle, and that's sort of the extent you would typically associate with a galaxy. And then this black stuff out here is what happens if you look at photographic plates and just count the number of stars. So you can actually get out to very, very faint levels in these galaxies by doing these star count analyses. So you can see there's a huge stream of stars piling into the galaxy from one side. And it looks like that's a little satellite galaxy which started out here somewhere. As it's falling in, it's got torn into these sort of long shred um, and is in the process of falling into the galaxy. Um, and then there's all these other messy bits. There's a dark patch over here, so there's an extra bunch of stars here. There's a bit that sticks out there. There's even a bit that sticks out on the other side entirely. It's basically not a nice, regular-looking collection of stars. And it really is because in these outer parts, you're seeing the remnants of bits and pieces that have fallen into the galaxy over time. Is this like when you see a really beautiful or a really handsome person, and then when you get up close to them, you see their faces and all the It really is. Face. You're seeing all the wrinkles. You really are seeing things which you only see when you look in very sharp focus, very much up close. And, you know, the, the camera up in a sharp focus close-up is never very flattering. Oh, well, you're tempting me, Mike. You're tempting me. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> you open up the book, you look at that picture, and you think, to my eye, it's very obvious what that is because I've grown up knowing that this is a majestic galaxy you know, a twin if not slightly larger than our own. But it's very interesting to imagine looking at that and thinking, oh, well that just might be something just beyond the nearest stars. To really understand the change in perspective that happened almost instantaneously when we placed these objects in their rightful place in the universe is really quite extraordinary.